counting the cost of being a medical practitioner. Awesome. Hey, uh, why did you become a doctor? Do you want the short answer or the long answer, Joa? <laughs> Uh, let's start with the short answer. Well, I'll then... start with the short <laughs> Yeah, we'll start with the short answer and then we'll go into the long. Sure. The summary version is I think it is a really powerful way to reach humanity and to touch the lives of others, sometimes in small ways and sometimes in big ways. And that journey for me really started with my own experience. In today's society, we call that lived experience. People are often looking for consumers or advisors who have lived through something because they've really experienced it for themselves and understand the, the pain, the emotions, the joys that go with an experience or go with a particular thing. Disability is a very good example of that or becoming a refugee in a country. Lived experience cannot be replaced. And I think it's very similar in medicine. Many people who work in the healthcare industry have lived experience Maybe a loved one has gone through something or they've experienced the healthcare system for themselves with their own medical problems. And that was my story when I was young. My parents had always wanted me to do something with my life. And so it was to their disappointment or even shock and surprise that unfortunately I had a chronic medical illness when I was a child, which required frequent medical attention, but also frequent hospital admissions. And the frequent hospital admissions would happen maybe two to three times, once every two to three weeks. And each time it would really stress my parents out, especially my, my mom. And they were looking for all sorts of different therapies and treatments, medications that could potentially help with this illness. But unfortunately, it didn't seem to be going anywhere. When they frequented the nearby hospital, the nearby private hospital to my home, they became um, or they became acquaintances with a doctor and his wife who were working in the hospital and who would often oversee my care. And it was through that lived experience of healthcare that really was the catalyst and the spark for me to think about medicine as a long time goal, but not just a goal, something that I wanted to aspire to later on in life. You see, many people think that medicine is a job. Being a doctor is a job. You know, it's a good job. It maybe pays well. It has prestige. It has respect of people in society. Some may even call medicine a career. You know, something that you wrap your life around or you structure your goals around. You kind of arrange the, the way, the choices you make around this. But I would argue that medicine is actually a way of life. And so for me, from a very young age, having lived through my own medical problems and seen how healthcare practitioners, especially doctors, were interacting with myself, but also my family, was really something that I aspired to do because I saw the impact that they could make in my life. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, what was the condition exactly? Uh, like what, what, what happened? How did you feel like two to three times a week? What did they do at the hospital when you were admitted? So back in those days, nowadays we have more upgraded technology, I had asthma, so regular um, difficulties with breathing. But in those days, you needed to use a nebulizer, which is a machine that requires you to inhale some of the medication. And, and nebulizers were not easily administered at home. If, you, if it didn't work well, you had to be in the hospital. And so if I had to go to hospital regularly for uh, nebulizer treatment to make my asthma better. Um, and so, you know, today you may be able to stay out of hospital, but in those days you weren't because the technology wasn't as advanced. Wow. So you couldn't breathe well and then the, you went to the hospital two to three times a week and you, through the use of nebulizer, you, were, you felt better, you were able to breathe better? Things with, the thing about nebulizers, and not to get too detailed into the medical stuff, but the thing about nebulizers is that it's a temporary relief. It's not a permanent relief. It doesn't, it doesn't cure your illness. It doesn't make it better long term. It just provides you the ability to be able to breathe better. It relaxes your airway muscles. And so while that's important and while going to the hospital is important um, to, to get that treatment and, and, and the emergency care being available is important, 
I think there's much more to it than that. Um, and that was really what my parents were starting to look for, something beyond just relief, something beyond just temporary treatment, something beyond just um, something that could relieve it for a period of time only to come back again. And it was through the experience at this hospital, especially with the doctors and the nurses who were there, that my family and my parents in particular began began to experience that. And I think that's what medicine really is. As a lifestyle, it's not just being about prescribing medication for patients, not just being there to help them temporarily, but really providing them the opportunity to have hope, the opportunity to see beyond uh, a quick fix, the opportunity to work with them to see improvement that may be slow, but happens over time with progressive growth. And I think that's the real joy of working in this field that you don't see perhaps in other vocations or other industries. Wow, that sounds really fascinating because myself also experienced the death of my, I mean, I mean the pain that my dad went through because he had cancer and I frequently went to the hospital and the hospital was a depressing place and people are eating in line, people are sick, people are stiff and they're 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 angry. They're 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 sad, and oh, I, w- I was soaking into that atmosphere. I was oh, I don't like hospitals. People are always, I mean, nobody looks happy. It, it looked happy it, it, to, uh, uh, to 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 from my experience. So I perceive a hospital a place where I wouldn't want to step into because I went there because my dad was sick, and he passed away eventually, um, and. The doctor told told my mom, he's done. Take him home. He's gonna die. There's nothing I can do. So, um, so at the hospital, I experienced not too much of a recovery. Um, I mean, I I I've, I've been to a hospital because I got a flu or a cold, but that was something that's that was stuck to me. So, um, I guess you had a very positive experience there. So, what kind of uh, tangible things that you experienced that you came from you uh, uh, you uh, you felt better what what was it that actually what, worked, worked with you? you see I think there's a lot of uh, focus these days in medicine around quick fixes I need to find a tablet or a pill or a treatment or a therapy that can cure me instantly uh, that can um, change me overnight or can fix my problem that I've been dealing with for many years when I think really the art of medicine is actually making man whole. And uh, that means healing humans in their entirety. And that means preventing disease before it starts, something we call preventative medicine. It means treating illness when we need to treat it. It means trying to make uh, steps to, to reduce the amount of treatment needed if we can use non-medication, non-pharmacological ways to do it but also even expanding to thinking about policies and thinking about things that we can institute at a population level. And medicine goes beyond just the individual, but also scales and zooms out to society as well. So for me, I experienced many of those things. I experienced things that uh, were not just about finding the medication. It was about understanding the non-medication ways of making asthma better. It was looking at things that could Uh, change in terms of lifestyle choices, diet choices, um, being more healthy. We call these preventative medicine type approaches that could not only help asthma, but also other conditions as well. We was also experiencing as a family, I think, the emotional support and hope that was there. And I think that that's a really important thing that sometimes we don't we don't fully acknowledge that, that doctors are not just there to provide physical and physiological help, but we're there to provide, we can also provide mental and even spiritual support for our patients and their families. And experiencing that through the experiences I had as a child and and my family going through that experience really um, crystallized and helped me to, to really picture what it would be like to become a doctor in the future, which I've now obviously done. Wow, that's amazing because uh, when I get a, a step into a, a doctor's office, uh, I think it's getting better these days, but um, customarily I would uh, see a doctor that wouldn't even make eye contact with me. They were looking at the piece of, piece of paper, they're 
they're they're super quick with you and they they just prescribe a medicine and I'll see you in in three weeks or like next month and and you experience emotional support and they even uh, helped you with the lifestyle choices or uh, diet choices what kind of diet choices did you make at that time and that led you to recovery so my family decided to try and again it was a trial at first to go on a vegan diet actually to take out both meat and dairy from um, our diet and, and particularly it was the dairy I think that helped um, significantly in terms of uh, asthma and allergies and eczema and things like that and since that time I've continued to have a plant-based diet because I think it's a, a healthy way to live and as we've been discovering recently also is good for the environment and the world around us and so it was through that starting point that we really began to look at other things as well not just you know having a plant-based diet but the importance of exercise the importance of uh, enough sleep and rest the importance of um, keeping temperate and all the things that we do uh, also things like um, hydrotherapy which is a, a um, therapy that has been actually recently used for COVID-19 uh, illness um, but has its principles in boosting the immune system to fight any potential triggers of asthma like respiratory illnesses Wow so as a former patient and a present doctor uh, would you say you are, you're completely um, healed from that condition or are you in the, still in the process of staying being healed Thing yeah, well, many people grow out of asthma. Yeah, many people grow out of asthma. Some kids uh, have asthma for the rest of their life. I haven't had an asthma attack for a long, long time. Um, and uh, we saw significant improvements once we made those lifestyle changes. Uh, not immediate, not overnight, as everyone hopes. But within a few weeks to months, the, there was a clear and significant down medication and so it was a very positive thing to be able to see that and to be able to witness that uh, not only uh, in my life but also the changes that my family were really making um, and those lifestyle changes benefited not only the asthma but also benefited other things um, including uh, you know, overall well-being and uh, the emotional kind of uh, uplift that comes with, with uh, having hope. Wow, that's awesome. So when you uh, see your patient, you actually uh, come in contact with them in a way they can actually, they can see that you care, like you give them emotional support because personally, I've never experienced that from a doctor in Korea. So how, so what kind of emotional I think that's really important to, did they, yeah, did they I think that's really important to, to remember, you know, yeah, you, you Doctors are incredibly busy because there's so much pressure and there's so much work to get through. But as I said, medicine is a lifestyle. It's not a job. With a job, you just have a set of tasks that you need to achieve. And the bigger the mountain of tasks, the faster you have to, and harder you have to work. And many times we may feel like that as you're going through medical school or you're thinking about getting to medical school or you're training as a doctor, training as a specialist. It's the workload just goes up and up and up and up. Um, and there seems to be no end. But there is light at the end of the tunnel because once, yes, the training is done or the studies are done and when you get to see the patients, you can always make small things that can brighten up not only the patients and their families' day, but also your day as well. And I think that's really important to understand and really important to consider um, when you're working through it. And what I mean by that is that you as a doctor can make an individual choice about the way you interact with your patients and the way you interact with your families that you see. And that individual choice will be something that leaves a lasting impact, depending on the way you want to run that consultation, the way you want to do that, and the philosophy that you bring to the table. If your philosophy is to get through as many patients as you can and to see as many patients as you can because that earns you money or gets your job list done, that's a very different philosophy to wanting to care for and provide holistic care to your patients. Mm. Wow. So, um, I mean, I'm, you just got to the, to the hotel, you just flew, you must be tired. Um, I'm going to talk about um, overworking, which killed my dad. And 
I, I have a friend in Germany that is also a medical doctor, and he says he's always tired. He's always tired. He's always like, like sleepy. So how do you deal with overworking? Um, uh, that 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 is pressured to be practiced. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm guilty myself. I think it's something that you have to be conscious, not only as a doctor, but also in other industries and other professions as well. It's really important to understand that it is not something that's isolated to medicine. Although medicine places you in a position where there is a lot of things to do and there is a lot of things to work on and to, to get done and to complete, uh, uh, you know, in, in set deadlines. I think really having a balance and finding and carving time out for uh yourself that's the way society puts it carve some time out for yourself but i find that it takes one step more than that because carving time out for yourself simply uh focuses all the attention on you and satisfying what you want and it means that you're relying on your own strength to actually uh, deliver um, and, and that can be an unhealthy uh it can, that can build an unhealthy complex in recent times um there have been more and more cases and episodes and discussion in them, even in the medical circles about me doctor well-being and doctor um, and, and medical professions uh, or medical professionals not coping and not understanding what resilience is and not being able to do it because for so long they've been relying to, on their own strength. And even if you carve out time to try and relax and recover and recuperate and go again, that you're running this hamster race of going round and round. And so for me, I think the thing that is a circuit breaker that really changes the paradigm is when you invest and when you uh, uh, do things that are meaningful in other ways that benefit others. Now, that might sound a bit counterintuitive, right? Like you doing things all week as a doctor, working really hard to help sick people. And then now you're saying you need to spend more time to actually balance it to help someone else. But actually that's true because by helping others, you actually gain help yourself. It's like, well, it's by giving, you are more blessed by giving than you are by receiving something. And so here's what I mean. For example, if you have some time that you carve out, maybe that's time that you can spend giving to your family that you don't see regularly. And maybe that's some a, a period or a way of saying, no, this time is blocked up for my family where I give, I'm not receiving. It's not like I'm going to have a spa and I'm going to have a massage and I'm going to have a holiday. Well, those things may be important or good and, and unnecessary. When you're saying, well, I need to find some work-life balance, I'm giving to my family or I'm giving to less privileged people. We call that concept altruism, that maybe giving of time, maybe giving of resources, maybe giving of money, maybe giving of a combination of all of those things. But there's also other things like understanding that the needs besides giving and, and altruism and, and helping others of really understanding what um, more concrete rest is, what does emotional rest look like, what does spiritual rest look like. And for me, what I do is I set time apart every week to actually spend a period of time where I disconnect from work altogether. My hospital knows that. My clinic knows that, my staff know that, my trainees know that, and I disconnect to connect on, on the emotional community and spiritual side. Those are not to refill my, my you know, kind of needs only. It's really about connecting with others with a central goal. And for me, that really sets the tone and gives refresh because it's not just about benefiting me. It's a mutual community growth and benefit. I'm a, um, I, I have my own religious and, uh, and spiritual faith. And for me, that forms the center and a core part of this recharging and balance that I find. By having this balance and by having an understanding that there, there needs to be this balance, it helps me to put uh, the rest of my work, even though I'm busy, into perspective and to prioritize what is going to be important. My work colleagues and others know that that time that I set apart for things that are outside of work is um, is clear. There are clear boundaries. I don't cross those boundaries. And it, even if there is an urgent thing, it can wait till after that time. And that allows me really that freedom and headspace without having to constantly think about work and constantly worry about something that I haven't done. Wow. 
So, uh, every week you have a uh, carved out 24 hours a, a week uh, that you dedicate to serve others. So, what, 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 what exactly do you do? Yeah, so I mean, it differs. So, I, like I said, I to told you about the emotional support and the emotional, um, uh, you know, uh, connection and the, and the community building and the spiritual component. I spend time uh, worshipping in my faith community. I spend time serving the underprivileged that may be going to do a soup kitchen, that may be going to uh, sing for people in a nursing home, that may be going to visit someone who is not doing well in the hospital, not as a doctor, but as a friend or as someone to support them. Uh, that may be also uh, doing other things. For example, encouraging uh, friends who are down or going through a difficult time and just listening that involves going to hike and to enjoy the outdoors. There's so many things that can uplift you while you're uplifting others. But most importantly, I think that it really has to be something that really clearly is different, set apart and dedicated away from work. Because otherwise, as doctors, <laughs> doctors well know, work just creeps back in somehow into, into uh, your email inbox or your patient list or your list of tasks to do. And it's never ending. There are always patients to see. There are always new things to do. There is always research to write. There are always projects to finish. There are always problems to solve. And if we cons consistently try and just stay one step ahead, we will never get there because we will always be two steps behind. That sounds like work. Do, do you literally feel refreshed when you do stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I know that I'm not going to get called. I know that I'm not going to uh, have to work. I don't check my email. I don't answer anything that comes through, uh, messages. I don't, I don't do any of that thing. And and while I think, think there is uh, in, importance in obviously if there's an emergency or whatever, but I think that, that dedicated and intentional uh, setting apart really is makes a huge difference. Wow, that's amazing. So... Um... So when did you, well, how old were you when you decided to become a doctor? Well, I always thought about it when I was going through primary school and early of high school. I was thinking, well, maybe medicine is a good thing to do. It was only 13, 14, but it really crystallized uh, kind of when I was 15 or 16. I really started, I did a work experience placement. I was really exploring different things. Uh, in Australia, we do medicine straight after high school. So when you turn 17 or 18, you start medical school straight away. And so for me, I had to make that decision already by the time I was 15 or 16 to choose the subjects to before the entrance into medicine. Um, and I haven't looked back. And people ask me, you know, if you had a choice now, what would you do if you could go back to university? And I say, I'll probably do the same thing because I, I really enjoy what I do. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. So... Did you have to maintain good grades to get into a good medical school all the way from elementary school or middle school or something? I mean, I think that good grades are one concept um, that is important to think about, JY, but I really think that it goes beyond good grades because in medical school, everyone is intelligent. You don't, you, you don't get into medical school if you're not intelligent. But then grades become less of an issue because the focus on grades can only get you so far in life. And I think it's much more to do with the long game. And when I say long game, we have this phrase we call long game, where it's talking about the long-term goals, the long-term success. What does long-term success look like? Short-term success means you top the class in this year and next year just to get over your competitors or your classmates. Long-term success actually looks like, well, you develop a work ethic that is disciplined. You develop a work ethic that is hardworking. You develop an a, a ethic a, a way of approaching tasks that means that you are diligent, that you take initiative and you take responsibility and that you're honest and have integrity. Those things are going to carry you way beyond your grades, even as you start training as a doctor. And so I think it's really important because those things don't happen overnight. You're not born with hard work. You have to learn what a culture of hard work is. You can be born, you, most people, let me put it a different way. If we had a choice, no one would want to undertake hard work. If we had a choice, everyone would just be lazy because that's the natural and easy thing to do. So 
what we're trying to cultivate is not so much you need to maintain good grades for all your classes and all your tuition and everything, but we really need to develop a work ethic that prides ourselves, and not in a proud way, but aspires to be excellent in all aspects of our, of our life, professional life, in your studies, in the way you carry yourself as a member of society, in the way you function as a member of your family, in the way you look after your parents, in the way you look after your spouse or your kids. Excellence carries all the way through. And when you get to a stage like now where I don't have to sit exams, it doesn't mean I sit back and be lazy and let everyone do everything else. <laughs> the equivalent of getting good grades is excelling at what you do when you set your heart to do it in your specialty area, in your research area, in your care of your patients. That's really important. So that's, that sounds amazing because um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something very um, uh, straightforward and honest. So I have uh, some nurse nurse friends, and uh, it's not it wasn't just one nurse saying, but some of them said uh, some somebody close to me said some doctors have just dug into the books. They don't know how to relate to people. They don't know how they're so, some of them are very antisocial. So, um, did you have any challenges like? having to consume all these things and then you have to be, to be supportive emotionally, you have to be. Well, uh, well here's the thing, right? You know, coming back to what we were discussing before about, you know, how do you find that work-life balance? I think this is where it comes in, okay? So most people think that going to medical school, getting to medical school is just being intelligent. You have to have a high IQ. You have to be good at learning your stuff, memorizing all the books and getting all the top marks in the exams. That will only get you into medical school. It doesn't help you to become a good doctor. Your IQ does not help you to become a good doctor. I can guarantee you that. In fact, we have very smart doctors who are, sorry, very smart people who have gone through medicine who are actually very poor doctors because the majority of the other component of it is actually being emotionally intelligent. And you don't develop emotional intelligence by reading a book. You don't develop emotional intelligence by studying or getting a good grade on the exam. You develop, you, you have high IQ, and that's why you do it. But you actually develop your emotional intelligence by interacting with people, by learning to give, by learning to understand and to feel other people's emotions, by, con by contemplating and being able to perceive and to see other people's perspectives. And how do you do that? Well, you do it by all the things I was talking about before, by understanding the importance of spirituality in your life, by understanding the importance of emotional support by understanding the importance of contributing to and receiving from a faith community or a, a shared community or your family and friends that's how you do it and when you skew yourself to one extreme where you just focus on study 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 to the neglect of everything else it actually makes you an unbalanced person just like it makes you un unbalanced in terms of work-life balance it makes you unbalanced in terms of how you run the way you, you you interact with people and that just that not that's just not you know that's not just for doctors that's for anyone but i think it becomes very evident in medicine that we can tell who has balance and who doesn't that sounds fantastic i think i know why i've seen too many doctors in korea that were very indifferent to patients and then now you're talking about and, and that's not components. to say they're stupid or that's not to say that they are doing the wrong thing maybe they're, they're working really hard i have no yeah. doubt that they care for their patients and that they are also uh you know uh, trying their best to do whatever they can but i think therein lies the crux of what i mean by medicine being a lot of because at some point in time, just like any other career, banking, engineering, accounting, finance, you run into this rat race and the rat race just goes round and round and round and round and you just keep chasing. And you don't want to come out the other end broken, depressed, suicidal, and then say, well, I, something needs to change. Overworked, compressed by everything down. You may be the smartest person, but the loneliest person. And many people go through what we call a midlife crisis, right? They get to this kind of Asian phase and they go, oh, you know, it's all too much. It's all, it's all, can't do it anymore. And so for me, this is what that balance is so that we don't go through the midlife crisis. So that we don't have to go through that. It's just the gentle calibration to understand that having a slightly different approach by, by looking at this you know paradigm shift it actually sets you up not only just for the way you interact with your patients and their families but also the way you're able to 
plan your career, structure your life, make life choices. And that is what brings the passion into medicine and sustains passion because otherwise you lose that passion very quickly when you face this mountain of things that you have to do. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Um, right now you're uh, in your early 30s and, and your dream got started when you were a teenager. So how are the phases of uh, ups and downs of your pursuing medicine, uh, being a, becoming a doctor that is passionate and emotionally uh, intelligent? You know, I wasn't always like that. You know, we all go through medical school. We're all studying hard. We're all going through trainees. We all face our ups and downs. Medicine is not a smooth roller coaster that goes up like this. And, <laughs> and everyone thinks it's you get in and it's like, you know, the paycheck is there and you, know, you can be happy forever. It doesn't happen like that. And, you know, there were, there were lots of setbacks. I decided to do medicine first. And along the way, I decided that I would like to do pediatrics. I, was, uh, I felt called towards pediatrics. Um, and I, I started to, to go in that direction. I applied for the residency training program and I didn't get in the first year round. A long story. And I, I pivoted a little bit to think about global health um, and thinking about looking at a population level, you know, being able to help different people around the world. And I, I did a Master's of Public Health that took me down a different path. And it was just, which is really fantastic. Lots of met lots of cool people, learned lots of new things, learned lot, learned lots of interesting ideas and concepts, uh, and, and really understood um, a little bit more about how that global, high level view of society. And that really, um, you know, sparked my interest in you know a whole range of other things, health administration and policy and, and things like that, which I still do to this day. Um, I then got into the pediatric training program and it you know it took me six or seven years to finish my training in the middle of my training i had to pass what we call the board exam or the, the kind of barrier exam and uh, i had to make a very important choice at that time um, i had particular convictions around how i mentioned to you before how i wanted to, my life to be governed and as a result there was some conflict with the preparation for those exams and I decided to stay true to what I, I uh, felt and prioritize my life and also my faith beliefs um, at the potential jeopardy or expense of failing those exams and having to wait a whole year to resit them again um, and by you know by God's grace I passed those exams and didn't have to resit it and was able to actually um, share about the reasons behind my decisions with my colleagues and the people I work with so it's been a, a journey that's gone round and round. I wish we had more time. We can <laughs> delve into a whole range of different things. But now I, I really have a nice balance where I spend some time working in public hospitals in a private setting in a clinic as well. Uh, I am a head of the pediatric department in a private hospital. I work in health technology and digital health and also a little bit of clinical research and um, health informatics. So I have a whole balance of different things that keep me interested and excited and passionate about what I do. Wow, that's, that's a, that sounds amazing. So how long is a medical school? Medical school in Australia is five years and then you have one year of internship after that. Everyone does that, a general internship, and then you go into your kind of training program. If you get in straight away, that, that's anywhere between five to eight years, depending on the type of specialty that you choose. So it's quite a long period of time. By the time you add it all up, it's probably 15 years of your life, 15 to 20 years wow. from when you start medical school. That's so long. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So you talked about integrity, you talked about community, you talked about helping others. Who models you when you were younger? Well, I think that's the really important point that you brought up because I think it's really important for all young players to think about the concept of mentorship. Mentorship is something that is vital, essential, and not done enough, not done uh, well by many people. Uh, we think that, you know, a lot of mentorship programs around the place try and pair people up and you kind of assign, you know, your mentor to you. That doesn't always work in my experience. And so when I was younger, I actually had a couple of mentors, some who were, one who was a doctor and one who wasn't, who was really able to help to guide me through making decisions around around medicine and then in medical school and the important things in life and it was having role models that uh, i could see 
that were not necessarily plotting the exact same path as me, but had more life experience and could provide a sounding board for some of the life's decisions that were really important in my uh, journey through. And I've tried to do the same for other um, younger medical students and trainees who are looking for that, uh, looking for their experience, that their guidance, that exposure. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really important. And so if anyone of your listeners is thinking about it, well, I would really recommend that you go and look for someone who can be a mentor for you, can be a sounding board that you respect, that uh, may ha may not necessarily be in the medical field, but can give you insights and experience that will help you in your journey. Wow, that sounds great. I, as I shared my plan for retirement and, and investment, all these things and you were sharing with me, uh, about the things that you studied yourself for like 20 weeks, 15 weeks or something. And it gave me a very fresh look, uh, very practical tips on it. I really appreciate that. Um, last question. So uh, how was your upbringing? Did it impact the way you uh, work as a doctor? Well, I think my parents really, they, they, did encourage me to consider medicine very strongly. But I think the biggest thing that I mentioned before in the way they brought me up was really around the concept of being supportive, but being supportive in a balanced way. But also nothing uh, more important than, than instilling key, key values. Some people call that character. Some people call that uh, 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 important traits in life. It doesn't matter what the name is. But I think the important thing to highlight is that the, the, the significance and the impact that it has over your entire life is really important. I learned the, the uh, uh, principles of hard work and diligence and responsibility and integrity for my parents. I learned the importance of um, of being frugal and saving. I learned the importance of um, being independent and uh, to rely uh, on uh, and not to expect other people to serve you. All these types of things, I think, really helped me in good stead as we come into, uh, as I you know went through my childhood, but also into my medical school and even until now. Um, those principles are important, and so I think as parents. Yeah, for those of you who are parents online, it's never too early to start instilling those things and principles into your child. It's not about teaching them math problems and, and solving English puzzles or, you know, learning, you know, 65 different musical instruments. Those things are important too. But I think the principle, there's nothing that replaces the principles and character more because you learn that predominantly from your parents and your family. You don't learn them from, from school necessarily. Wow. Thank you so much, Daryl. Your interview was as great as your sister's interview. And you, you, both of you guys, you two siblings, are serving people. Um, very inspiring. Very. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's kind of exceptional the way your parents and your community modeled uh, for you. And then more people are coming up under your help, like support. So that's awesome. Um, wow. I'm getting old. I gotta gotta give back to society now. Can't take anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 what we need to do. That's awesome. It was great to hang out with you also uh, for short two days, three days. I know it was fun. I wish it could have been longer. Maybe next time I have to stay longer. Yeah. Hopefully, I can visit, or you visit, or 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 we can meet somewhere. Um, we can figure. It. I'm sure we can figure something out. I will we'll pray for your Bible camp, the JM camp, and other things as well. You know, if, if there's some way that we can collaborate in the future, let's try and see whether we can make it work. We experimented with an evangelistic series uh -huh. um, online during COVID, and we had people join from different states, like uh, Melbourne, Sydney. We had a Melbourne and then Sydney and Adelaide. So we, we were looking at you know different ways of actually making something like that more um accessible and it looks bigger you know when you got all oh, people from korea people from singapore or wherever else joining so yeah we're, we're thinking about different different things yeah i think you talked about that last time when you had a meeting like 10 years ago like can you come to australia <laughs> <laughs> see told you okay. come to australia i can come to korea you can come yeah to australia. I'll, 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 I'll pray about it and we'll see
Sounds good. Yep. Thank you so much. Hope you have a good rest. No worries. Stay in touch, man. Yep. Excellent.